Good afternoon, students. Today is Thursday, 3 February 2022. This will be our third lecture on the essay by Lon Fuller. It'll be fairly short. I'm thinking maybe 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, I'm going to remind you that our first exam is two weeks from today on the 17th of February. The exam will be given on Canvas and you will have a 75 minute period in which to take the exam. It starts at 8 in the morning and it ends at 9.15, 75 minutes. Now that's the time ordinarily that you would be taking the exam in the classroom. So you should have no conflicts, no work conflicts or anything else. Okay, it's 8 o'clock in the morning until 9.15, two weeks from today. Um, as far as postings go on Canvas, I think the only thing I've put up since we met a couple of days ago is a one-page uh, reconstruction of the argument by Stephen Wise that we'll be discussing starting next week on Tuesday. And I also posted a letter to you yesterday, I believe it was yesterday <clears throat> evening, and in that letter I explained how things are going to um, occur going forward. Now Tuesday I will be back in the classroom on Tuesday and Thursday and because I have a, a student or more than one student who has who cannot be in the classroom I've decided I'm going to continue with the recorded lectures for the rest of this month but on the first of March I plan to be back in the classroom lecturing live with no recorded videos at that point. So a few more days of videos. Yes, I will be in the classroom, but I will not be lecturing. That would be repetitive. I'm not going to lecture both um, on recording and in the classroom. It's gonna be one or the other. So for a while there will be recorded lectures and then on the 1st of March, I will be lecturing live in the classroom by which time the student or students will be ready to go back. Okay, so let's get back to where we left off in the essay by Lon Fuller. And let me remind you that you should start reading the essay by Stephen Wise. We'll get started on that uh, next week. And so my lectures next week, the two recorded lectures will both be on Stephen Wise. Okay, so let me turn to my lecture notes. You can follow along if you'd like. I'm gonna begin on page eight of my lecture notes. Today we'll be discussing the opinions of two justices, Justice Keen, that's K-E-E-N, and Justice Handy. And then I'll have a few concluding thoughts about the essay and about the case. Now, Justice Keen is a soulmate of, Ju of Chief Justice Truepenny. You may recall, Chief Justice Truepenny voted to affirm the convictions and the sentence of death. Uh, he didn't say much by way of justifying that decision. Justice Keene has more to say, but both of them would affirm the convictions. Um, <clears throat> so let's get started on Justice Keene. Justice Keene begins by pointing out that this case is not about two things. First of all, the case is not about executive clemency. Executive clemency is, is up to the chief executive of New Garth. It's not up to the judge, the justices of the Supreme Court of New Garth. So whether executive clemency should be extended is not a matter for the justices. And so Justice Keene is, uh, by implication, criticizing Chief Justice Truepenny. You may recall Chief Justice Truepenny wrote in his opinion that the chief executive should commute the sentences of the four defendants. Okay, and Justice Truepenny um, voted to affirm the convictions, but then he added the chief executive should probably uh, commute the sentences. Justice Keene is saying that that's none of the court's business. That's totally up to the chief executive. The second matter that 
the court should not be concerned with, according to Justice Keene, is morality. Whether the defendants acted morally or in accordance with moral principles is irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the issue in this case. The ju justices are there on the court to decide the legality of what they did and not the morality of what they did. So uh, the court is concerned with legal matters, not with moral matters. Other people can argue about the morality of what they did. That would be a good thing, but it's not within the role of the judge to make moral judgments. The ju justices are there to make legal judgments, to enforce the law. The question for the court, according to Justice Keene, is simply whether the defendants willfully took the life of Roger Wetmore. And Justice Keene thinks that the answer to that question is obvious. Yes, they did. The statute is clear. It clearly applies to the facts of this case. And the result is that the court, according to Justice Keene, should affirm the convictions and the sentence of death. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that Justice Keene <clears throat> um, agreed with Chief Justice Truepenny that the convictions should be confirmed, I'm sorry, affirmed. Justice Keene proceeds to criticize the Chief Justice for, quote unquote, instructing the Chief Executive to commute the sentences. And as I just pointed out, Justice Keene thinks that that's inappropriate. It's not the role of the justice to tell the chief executive what to do. Ironically, Justice Keene then proceeds to do pretty much the same thing Chief Justice Truepenny did, except according to, Ju to Justice Keene, the chief executive should pardon the men and not merely commute their sentences. Now, I've already explained to you the difference between a pardon and a commutation. Pardons are of people. Commutation is of a sentence. To commute a sentence means to lessen it in some way, uh, to decrease the severity of it. Uh, Justice Keene thinks that the men should be pardoned, and that would mean that the sentence of guilt, I'm sorry, the verdict of guilt and the sentence of death would be wiped from the record. It would be as though the trial never occurred the men would have no conviction on their record going forward. They would be free, and it would be as though they had committed no crime. It would be as though they had never even been tried. So <clears throat> um, we'll see when we get to, G to Justice Handy's opinion. Justice Handy criticizes Justice Keene for doing the same thing that he criticized Chief Justice Truepenny for doing. In both cases, they are offering up their personal opinion. Remember what I called that? That's called obiter dicta, which is mere words that have no legally binding significance or effect. And Justice Handy, uh, jabbing at Justice Keene, says that Justice Keene is using taxpayer money to publish his personal thoughts, right? Remember, Supreme Court opinions are published at taxpayer expense. They're published in impressive bound volumes that cost a lot of money. Justice Keene, according to Justice Handy, is offering up his private thoughts about what the chief executive should do. And since those words will extend the length of his opinion when it's published, he is in effect wasting taxpayer money. So there's a little bit of uh, ribbing or jabbing going on between the justices. Now, let's turn to Justice Keene's criticism of Justice Foster. Remember, Justice Foster made two arguments for reversal of the convictions. The first argument was that there was a failure of presupposition in the case, and the second criticism was that the purpose of the statute would not be furthered or fulfilled if the sentences of death were upheld. So Justice Foster made alternative arguments for the same conclusion, namely that the conviction should be reversed. Now Justice Keene proceeds to mock 
And really, mock is the appropriate word. Justice Keene mocks Justice Foster. He says that Justice Foster ignores the principle of legislative supremacy. <clears throat> Justice Foster ignores the plain meaning of the statute and instead substitutes his sense of what the purpose of the statute is or what the spirit of the statute is. In other words, Justice Keene accuses Justice Foster of being a judicial activist. Now, judicial activism is when a judge acts as a legislator instead of as a judge. Remember, judges are not lawmakers. Legislators are lawmakers. The judge's job is different. Once the law is made, the job of the judge is to interpret it and enforce it. And Justice Keene is claiming that Justice Foster went beyond the scope of a judge. He was a judicial activist. What judges should do, according to Justice Keene, is show restraint. They should exhibit judicial restraint. That's the opposite of judicial activism. A restrained judge has a clear sense of his or her role. A restrained judge resist the temptation to make law or to twist and distort a statute so that it means something other than what the legislature meant by it. So there's a little bit of ribbing or mocking going on here. He says, <clears throat> Justice Keene says that judicial restraint means not allowing your personal predilections to come into play. Those are his words, personal predilections. You should, not, you should not decide a case based on your own personal morality or your own personal preferences, your personal predilections, your personal politics or religion. Right? There's nothing wrong with having a moral code. There's nothing wrong with having religious beliefs There's not, or, or not having religious beliefs. All of that is fine. The problem is that when you're acting as a judge, those things should not and must not come into play. And Justice Keene thinks that Justice Foster did allow them to come into play. So he's not being faithful to the legislature or to the law. According to Justice Keene on page 633, the quote, obligation of the judiciary is to enforce faithfully the written law and to interpret that law in accordance with its plain meaning without reference to our personal desires or our individual conceptions of justice, unquote. Now, I have a couple of examples in my lecture notes of U.S. Supreme Court justices who issued rulings that went against what they personally believed or desired. <clears throat> Let me give you a quick sketch of them. In 1989, the U.S. Supreme Court decided a case called Texas versus Johnson. A young man in Dallas, it so happens, burned an American flag on the courthouse steps. He was protesting something. I can't remember offhand what it was, but he was protesting some action of the government, and he thought that burning a flag would be an appropriate way to protest. He was arrested for, um, I don't know what the specific charge was. He was arrested probably for um, having creating a fire in public or doing some trespassing on the steps of the courthouse or something like that, some minor offense. Well, he didn't just pay the fine or take the punishment. He, su he appealed his conviction, and he claimed that he had a First Amendment right to speak or to express himself by burning the flag. Now, John Paul Stevens, who was then a member of the Supreme Court, I believe John Paul Stevens had a military background, and I think that the actions of this young man, Gregory Johnson, offended him deeply. But he didn't let that sway him. Justice John Paul Stevens ruled that Gregory Johnson did indeed have a First Amendment right to express himself by burning the flag. And Justice Stevens 
pointed out that that act of his was personally offensive to him. But that's irrelevant. As a justice, his role, his job, is to interpret the Constitution and apply it to the facts of the case. Uh, his, his role as a judge does not include bringing his own personal views into play or his own, offended, his own sense of offense. My second example involves Clarence Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas. In 2003, in a case called Lawrence versus Texas, another Texas case, <clears throat> a young man was uh, arrested and, or ticketed for having sex with another man. Uh, now, you can go read this case online and look at the details. It's not important what the details are. A young man was arrested and, and charged with violating a Texas law that prohibited what's, what was called homosexual sodomy, sexual relations between two men or two women. <clears throat> now, this case was tried and uh, appealed, and Justice Clarence Thomas <clears throat> voted to uphold the Texas anti-sodomy law, but then he added that if he were a legislator in the state of Texas, he would not have voted for such a law, and if there were such a law already on the books, he would vote to repeal it. Justice Thomas said, this is a silly, maybe even a stupid and unwise law that Texas has. But the law is valid in Texas, and the question before the court was whether Texas may, under the Constitution, have such a law. And Justice Thomas answered to that question, yes. Texas can have a stupid law on its books if it wants. So there's a case where Justice Thomas said, if I were a legislator, I would vote to repeal that law. But I'm not a legislator. I'm a justice of the Supreme Court. My job is different. I'm not a lawmaker. I'm a judge. And as a judge, my job is simply to compare the Texas law, however stupid I think it is, compare it to the Constitution and see whether the Constitution prohibits it. And in my judgment as a judge, it does not. So there you have two cases where <clears throat> a judge on the U.S. Supreme Court, a justice, had a different personal view of some matter than his or her judicial view or view as a judge. Okay, so Justice Keene is in effect accusing Justice Foster of making a decision in this case based on irrelevant considerations, his own personal views. Now, it gets worse. The mockery gets worse. Justice Keene, if you look at page 634, makes fun of his colleague, Justice Foster. He says, Justice Foster can reach any result he wants in a case just by applying the following formula. He says, I think I could actually reduce it to three steps. <clears throat> so let's read a little bit. Uh, it, it'll make you chuckle. At least it made me chuckle when I read it. Here's what he says on page 634. We are all familiar with the process by which the, the judicial reform of disfavored legislative enactments is accomplished. Anyone who has followed the written opinions of Mr. Justice Foster will have had an opportunity to see it at work in every branch of the law. I am personally so familiar with the process that in the event of my brother's incapacity, I am sure I could write a satisfactory opinion for him without any prompting whatever, beyond being informed whether he liked the effect of the terms of the statute as applied to the case before him. <clears throat> so up till now, Justice Keene is saying, I could, if you told me what result Justice Foster wanted, I could write the opinion in support of that judgment because I've seen him do it over and over again. And here's how it goes. The process of judicial reform requires three steps. <clears throat> 
The first of these is to divine some single purpose which the statute serves. This is done, although not one statute in a hundred has any such single purpose, and although the objectives of nearly every statute are differently interpreted by the different classes of its sponsors. The second step is to discover that a mythical being called the legislator, in the pursuit of this imagined purpose, overlooked something or left some gap or imperfection in his work. Then comes the final and most refreshing part of the task, which is, of course, to fill in the blank thus created. Quad arat faciendo. Now that's a Latin phrase that means that which was to be done. So Justice Keene is mocking or making fun of his fellow justice, Justice Foster. He's saying that Justice Foster isn't showing proper fidelity to the law. He makes up his mind who should prevail in the case. He then ascribes a purpose to the legislation, to the law. He then finds that the purpose is not fulfilled by, by applying the law in a certain way. So he adds something to the law. And lo and behold, when you put that in there, you get the result that Justice Foster wanted for other reasons. Justice Keene is accusing of Justice Foster of what I called earlier result-oriented jurisprudence. He's accusing Justice Foster of making up his mind who should win on the basis of personal, moral, political, or perhaps religious reasons, and then coming up with a judicial rationale or justification for that decision or judgment. So he's accusing his justice of his fellow justice of being result-oriented. And that, of course, is disreputable. You should not do that if you're a judge. Okay, what else do I want to say about Justice Keene? Uh, he points out that it's the job of the legislature of Newgarth to make law. If the Supreme Court of Newgarth rules that this statute does not have an exception built into it, then the legislature may take it upon itself to amend the law. The legislature can add, next time it meets, it can add a subsection to this section of the law specifying that if someone killed another out of necessity, then that person does not run afoul of the law. The law does not apply in that case. It's up to the legislature to do that, not to a judge or justice on a court. So in a way, the court can force the legislature to be more specific over time. The court lets the legislature know, we are not going to fill in any gaps. If you leave holes in the statutes that you enact, we're not going to fill those holes. That's your job. And there may be results that are unfortunate, as there are in this case. So Justice Keene's attitude seems to be, we must apply the law as it's written. That means affirming the convictions of these four defendants. That means affirming their death sentences. And if they are carried out, if the sentences of death are carried out, it's not our fault, right? We're judges. It's if anyone's fault, it's the fault of the legislature for letting it happen. The legislature wrote a law that covers their behavior. And the legislature could have written an exception into the law that would let these four defendants go free. So Justice Keene is passing the buck, isn't he? He's saying that the job of the judge is limited. And if these four men are put to death, the fault or blame lies with the legislature, not with us, not with the justices of the Supreme Court. Now that seems harsh, doesn't it? Uh, to pass the buck like that. 
but Justice Keene has a clear sense of his role and his duty as a justice, and he will not be swayed to do things uh, to save these men. And that's why he's so critical of Justice Foster. He thinks that Justice Foster is doing somersaults, judicial somersaults, to save the lives of these men. Okay, one more opinion and we'll be done with this case. <clears throat> this opinion is by Justice Handy. It's the longest opinion of the five. It goes on for eight pages, but our discussion of it will not take long because according to Justice Handy, this is an easy case. It's a clear case. These defendants in Justice Handy's view are innocent. They did nothing wrong and it would be a travesty of justice if, they, if their convictions and sentences of death are allowed to be carried out. If the conviction is upheld and the sentences are allowed to be carried out. Justice Handy says that the other justices are engaged in logic chopping, which implies that they're just machines mechanically applying the law as it's written to the facts of the case and deducing a conclusion. Notice, deducing is a type of reasoning. Right? It's de deduction, where you have a major premise, a minor premise, and from them follows a conclusion, necessarily. So Justice Handy is, in effect, accusing uh, his colleagues, Justice Truepenny and Justice Keen of engaging in what's called logic chopping. And that's a disreputable thing. Let's read a little bit from page 637, to give you a flavor for uh, what Justice Handy is saying. He said, he's saying, um, I will go farther and say that not only are the principles I've been expounding those which are soundest for our present conditions, but that we would have inherited a better legal system from our forefathers if those principles had been observed from the beginning. For example, with respect, oops, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong part. I have different highlights on this page and I meant to be reading the second highlighted portion. It took me a few words to realize I was reading the wrong thing, sorry. Here's Justice Handy from a little bit lower on page 637. He says, the problem before, oops, I'm sorry. I have listened with amazement to the tortured radiocinations to which this simple case has given rise. Now that's an old fashioned word, radiocinations. It just means reasonings. So he's saying my, my colleagues are engaged in tortured reasoning. He says, I never cease to wonder at my colleagues ability to throw an obscuring curtain of legalisms about every issue presented to them for decision. We've heard this afternoon learned disquisitions on the distinction between positive law and the law of nature, the language of the statute and the purpose of the statute, judicial functions and executive functions, judicial legislation and legislative legislation. And he goes on to continue mockery. But what he's saying is, at least two of his fellow justices, Truepenny and Keene, are engaged in what he calls tortured reasoning to arrive at certain results. And that, of course, is disreputable, according to Justice Handy. Needless abstractions. Really, this case is simple, according to Justice Handy. It's a matter of practical wisdom. What should we, the justices of the Supreme Court of New Garth, do with these defendants? These defendants, not defendants in general, but these four particular men who were convicted and sentenced to death. According to Justice Handy, the result, intuitively speaking, is clear. These men did nothing wrong they certainly didn't do something so wrong that it warrants the death penalty, which is prescribed by statute. What the court should do is resort to the sentiments of the common man or woman. 
The court should look at public opinion. The court should use common sense and act accordingly. Those are the sorts of things that a justice should bring to bear in deciding a case. The court should strive to be efficient. The court should use common sense. The court should be flexible. The court should look at the realities of the situation and not some hypothetical scenario. The court should be result-oriented. Now, that should come as a shock to you because up until now, I've been telling you that justices accuse other justices of being result-oriented and they consider that a bad thing for a judge to be. Justice Handy embraces it. Justice Handy says that's what we should be doing. We should get the correct result and then write an opinion that justifies it, that supports it, that rationalizes it, in the good sense of rationalizes it. Rationalize in the good sense means to provide reasons in support of. In fact, Justice Handy goes further and says that even ju ju extrajudicial considerations may be brought to bear in deciding the case. And he has in mind things like public opinion polls, uh, information that you have gleaned from doing internet research, uh, that sort of thing. These are things that didn't come out in court during the trial. It's information that a justice can get outside of the judicial process. And Justice Handy thinks that's perfectly acceptable. So when you put it all together, Justice Handy thinks this is a simple, straightforward case. These men do not deserve to die. Probably anyone else, including the justices, would have acted the same way they, they did. They would have had some sort of lottery the loser of the lottery would have been killed and eaten to sustain the lives of the other four. So Justice Handy would vote to reverse the convictions. So there you have it. We have had five justices, each wrote separately. Two of the five voted to affirm the convictions of the trial court and the death sentence that resulted from, that, from those convictions. Two of the five justices voted to reverse the convictions and the sentences of death. So that's two to two. What about the fifth justice? Well, that was Justice Tan Tadding. Justice Tadding, as you know, decided to withdraw from the case. So we have two for affirmance, two for reversal, and one withdrawal. And you may be wondering, what happens in a case of a tie? Well, the rule is, if there's a tie, the lower court ruling stands. It takes a majority to reverse a case, to reverse a lower court ruling. So because there was no majority, the lower court ruling, which was a sentence of death, stands. And remember, the chief executive can pardon the four defendants or commute their sentences. And it's not up to the chief it's not up to the justices of the Supreme Court what the chief executive does. And we don't know what the chief executive did. All we know is that the Supreme Court, by a two to two vote, let stand the lower court ruling, which is death. And therefore, it's all up to the chief executive. Fuller didn't tell us what the chief executive did. For all we know, the chief executive uh, said no pardon, no commutation, uh, and so on. Okay? Now, what was the purpose of this case? Why did Fuller, why did Lon Fuller, a famous law professor, write and publish this hypothetical case? Well, here's what he says about it. Fuller says, the case was constructed for the sole purpose of bringing into a common focus certain divergent and perennial philosophies of law and government, unquote. So Justice Fuller, who is also a student of history, knows that uh, courts for many centuries now 
and probably for many centuries going forward, courts will be grappling with the same judicial philosophies, the same philosophies of law and government. And he decided he would write up a hypothetical case to bring them clearly into focus. So I suspect that this case, this article, with this hypothetical case built into it, this article will be read probably hundreds of years from now uh, by law students, law professors, students in philosophy classes like yours. Uh, this case is perennial. It's dealing with some perennial issues that go back to the ancient world and will probably extend far into the future. You may recall that this case was set in the year 4300. So right now we're in the year 2022. This case, this article was published in 1949. And the case itself is set in the year 4300. Why did Fuller pick that year? There's actually a reason for it. He says the year 4300, the, I'm sorry, the year 4300 was chosen because 1949, the year in which this article was published, lies midway between the age of Pericles and the year 4300. Now, you may not know what that means. Pericles was a statesman in ancient Greece, a very famous military leader and statesman. Pericles lived between 495 and 429 BCE, which means before the Common Era. Okay, so Pericles lived before Socrates, before Plato, before Aristotle. Pericles was a great statesman. There's a funeral oration that was written by Pericles and delivered at his funeral. You can find it online and read it if you'd like. So Pericles lived at about 402 BCE. Then you have at the other end of the spectrum, the year 4300. Halfway between them is 1949. So Fuller um, figured out how long it had been since Pericles, and then he doubled it and set this case in the future in the year 4300. So no, no great mystery as to why it's 4300. Um, final thought, is there some way to help you remember the judicial philosophies of these five justices? I got to wondering that myself a few years ago and I hadn't seen anybody write about it or speculate about it, but here's what I came up with. Remember, two of the justices voted to affirm the convictions. They believe that this is an easy case. The statute is clear. It clearly applies to the facts of this case. And the result is that the convictions are to be upheld and the sentences of death. Now, who are those two justices? Truepenny and Keene. Now, the names themselves suggest what? They suggest... Fidelity, true penny has the word true in it. When you're true to someone, if you're true to your spouse, that suggests that you're faithful to your spouse. So maybe Fuller chose the name true penny because Chief Justice True Penny was trying to be faithful to the letter of the law. What about keen? The name keen connotes rigidity or strictness. We say, for example, I'm keen to do the right thing. I'm determined to do the right thing. It's important to me to do the right thing. So keenness suggests, has a kind of connotation of strictness or um, rigorousness. And again, Justice Keen voted to affirm the convictions. He was very strict about applying the statute to the facts and drawing the appropriate conclusion. What about the two justices who voted to reverse the convictions, Foster and Handy? Those names suggest a certain flexibility 
or softness. Uh, we, we speak of certain things fostering um, other things. Let me think of an example. Uh, my, uh, my classroom policy fosters discussion, right? It encourages discussion. It promotes discussion, probably by design. Okay, so when you foster something, you are encouraging it or trying to bring it about, in a, often in a gentle way. What about handy? We, we describe people as handy. I'm, I'm handy around the house. Actually, I'm not, but some people are. Uh, a, hand, a handyman, uh, a handy person, is someone who knows a lot of practical skills. What, what could describe Justice Handy better than that? Justice Handy said, everything may be brought to bear in deciding a case. Anything and everything, from public opinion polls to common sense to uh, internet research, uh, whatever, you, whatever helps you decide the case, use it. Right? He's handy. He's open-minded. Maybe too open-minded. And what about Justice Tadding? Justice Tadding is the justice who withdrew from the case. He was indecisive. He, um, he was ambivalent. He couldn't make his mind up. Uh, he, you might think that he was unreliable. Uh, justice should make a decision one way or another. Justice Tadding couldn't be relied upon to do that. Um, what does the name tatting have to do with that? Well, the first thing that came to my mind was tattletale. A tattletale, as you know, is someone who, uh, who, who squeals on you to, to a teacher or a parent. Uh, they're unreliable. Tattletales can't be relied upon to keep a secret or to be quiet. They'll tattle on you at the first chance they get. So tatting is unreliable like a tattletale. Anyway, I had a little bit of fun with this. I got to wondering whether Fuller chose the names based upon the rulings of the justices. And it seemed to me you could make a case that True Penny and Keene were the rigorous, strict ones. Uh, uh, Handy and Foster have names that suggest openness, flexibility, softness. And tatting has a name that suggests uh, unreliability, like a tattletale. Okay, I hope you enjoyed reading and thinking about and talking about this case. Now, we didn't, you were unable to talk because of the recording format, but in the classroom, you could have raised your hand and made a comment. So I hope you've enjoyed reading, thinking about, and uh, would have enjoyed talking about this case had we been in the classroom. Um, I always enjoy teaching it. I'm going to miss teaching it when I retire eventually. Um, I always learn something new every time I teach it, every time I reread it. Uh, it it's fun to teach. Um, it's interesting. And maybe best of all, it's relevant to the law today. This, as I said a moment ago, it's a perennially interesting topic. And guess what? The justices on the Supreme Court today have views that are similar to the views of the five justices in this case. And there probably always will be justices who fall into one or more of these categories. Some justices believe that their role is to follow the letter of the law. Other justices are willing to look at the spirit of the law some justices want to op take an open-ended approach, like Justice Handy, and let anything from common sense to public opinion play a role in the decision-making. Um, some justices are result-oriented, and some are not. Some of the justices who are result-oriented are proud of it, like Justice Handy, and think it's the proper method. Other justices are result-oriented, and either they don't know it, they don't realize it, or they realize it and think it's acceptable. Uh, or perhaps they think that it's 
unacceptable, but in a particular case, it's justifiable as an exception to the rule. At any rate, that's, that completes our discussion of this case. The next time I see you, now let me be clear what's going to happen on Tuesday. I'm going to be going back into the classroom every Tuesday and Thursday, starting on the 8th of February, which is next Tuesday. But because we have one or more students who cannot go into the classroom, I am required by law to make videos for him, her, or them. And I will not make videos and also give a live lecture. So for a short period of time, I'm going to continue recording videos like this. But on the 1st of March, I'm going to be lecturing live in the classroom with no more videos. So it's a compromise. I'm trying to accommodate this student or these students. By the way, I'm not being coy. Uh, you don't know how many students are involved. It could be one or it could be more than one. You don't know what the reason is, except that it's a legal reason. Um, it's really not important that you know any of the answers to, this question, to these questions. All you, all you need to know is that we're going to be doing recorded videos for another few days, and then we'll switch over to the classroom on the 1st of March. Okay, I will, however, continue to post my lecture notes for the remainder of the semester. I've been posting. So far, I've posted my lecture notes on Oren Kerr's essay. I've posted my lecture notes for Lon Fuller's essay. And today, later today, I will post my lecture notes for the third reading, which is by Stephen Wise. And I'm going to do that for the remainder of the semester. Okay? So I hope that helps you in your studying, and it will help you follow along when you watch my videos or listen to me lecture live in the classroom. Okay, that's enough for today. Um, I'll get this posted. I'll send you an email when it's posted. And um, if you come to class on Tuesday, I will not be lecturing. I'll be there, but I'll be occupying myself with something else, such as reading or preparing lecture notes for my ethics course. You're welcome to come to class um, at 8 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, but there will be no lecture. Instead, you may, if you want, watch your recorded lecture in the room. But please use headphones so that anyone else in the room, including me, can do what we want to do without distraction or disruption. So feel free to come to the classroom and read or do whatever you want, um, including watch the video. Just do it with headphones on so uh, you don't bother anyone else. Okay, I hope you understood all that. I'll see you um, either in the classroom on Tuesday or on video. I'll post my next video on Monday for you. All right, so long.